on air and online with the Young Turks, directly from the pages of Newsweek magazine, Michael Hirsch. All right, so we brought that back, huh? Okay. <laughs> Haven't heard that for a while. Yeah, that's right. How you doing, Michael? All right, how are you, Jake? Uh, good, good. All right, so let's talk about Israel. Uh, we we got a sticky situation over here. Uh, Netanyahu and Obama don't seem to be on good terms. Uh, we had a, a situation in Israel where Biden went and wanted to start the peace talks, and instead he was uh, given a rude surprise uh, when they announced new settlements in East Jerusalem. You think there might be something else at play here as to why Obama's uh, so angry at Netanyahu? Tell us what that is. Well, it's really not so much what I think, but what you know. I reported. I spoke to a very senior level uh, administration official uh, about this last week, and he said, "Look, uh, the real message to the Israelis, the reason Obama was so incensed by this cropping up during the Biden visit, that is the the issue of the settlements, is uh, they're telling the Israelis, look, you're not keeping your eye on the ball. The issue here is Iran." As this official described it to me, Iran is the number one priority, it's the number two priority, and it's the number three priority. And, uh, and this is for Israel, at least as much for the U.S. I mean, this is what the Israelis themselves deem an existential threat, namely the Iranian nuclear program. The point being that you can't be, allow ourselves to be distracted by this infighting between the United States and Israel, uh, which obviously translates, you know, transmits to the rest of the world uh, that there is uh, uh, trouble uh, you know, in this alliance. Uh, at a time when this alliance is needed and when the president's prestige and influence needs to be at a, at a maximum to gain uh, sanctions against Iran. And that was really the message that Biden was there to deliver, according to this official. I'm, I'm really interested in the mechanics of this, because when Biden goes to give that message about Iran, did Netanyahu know he was going to get that message about Iran, and did the settlement announcement anyway, or had he just not had a chance to talk to Biden yet, and he wanted to be a tough guy and did this announcement and then found out, oops, Biden was coming to talk to him about Iran. Well, of course, uh, you know, Netanyahu is maintaining that he didn't know about this. He was blindsided. He had radical Let's get members of his that. coalition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not absolutely sure that, that Netanyahu knew it was coming. Certainly, though, uh, he has supported the policy of doing additional uh, uh, settlements, and you know that's what we're seeing playing out this week in the meeting with the, with President Obama, and the, the fact that the two of them disagreed uh, and still do so severely about that. Uh, but I think the, the point that I was trying to make is this is the reason, this is the main reason uh, Obama was so uh, angered uh, by this announcement and by the way the Israelis uh, continue to kibitz here. Uh, in 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 uh, you know just on the verge of new talks announced to 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 come ahead and and and, and scotch it with this, uh, the reason that Obama was so upset is because he's saying to the Israelis, look, you're not keeping your eye on what is your own, you the Israelis' main security issue. Uh, now you know there were other reports that uh, Biden also transmitted to the Israelis. Look, uh, you know the U.S. has a lot at stake here. We got a lot of troops in the region. We have a lot of lives at stake. Uh, and the unresolved Israeli-Palestinian conflict is putting them further at jeopardy. And I think there was a little bit of that between the lines. But the Iran message was really the main message I was told uh, was that, that was supposed to be delivered here. We're talking to Michael Hirsch from Newsweek. Michael, the reason I, I was asking about that is because if they know that Biden's coming to help them on their top priority and they still do this, then it's kind of a double slap in the face. And right. I mean, that's a slap in the face. I think there was also a sense that the Biden, uh, that Obama had uh, that after uh, a previous announcement last fall uh, that also took the Americans by surprise, that it wouldn't happen again. You know, there was, there was some sense we've gotten from various officials that uh, there was an understanding, although the Israelis, I think, are denying that there was any understanding. Uh, but, you know, it, it just really uh, uh, heaped uh, a lot of fuel on, uh, on a smoldering, smoldering fire that was there. Uh, because the U.S. is right now leading this effort in the U.N. Security Council uh, and in foreign capitals to put, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to really uh, put the clamps on, on the Iranian economy. And, and this, this just does not help. Indeed, it, it, it takes things in the opposite direction. I mean, there's a funny little th irony here, because, you know, the Congress is, uh, 
you know, all over Netanyahu. They're smothering him with love no matter what he does uh, in undermining uh, the president. Uh, but the president is mad at him because he's not, he's doing it so ineffectively that he, the president is hamstrung from helping Israel even more. <laughs> so when you look yeah. at all of that, I mean, there's a level of comedy here, Michael. I mean, who's the benefactors here? I mean, who's the one getting the $3 billion? Who's the one that's the, right. I mean, it, it's just. Well, you know, look, this is a, this is a fight that's, you know, you, you can't, First of all, treat Israel as a monolithic entity because inside Israel there's very an true. intense battle going on over these very political issues. The whole reason for the Kadima party that was created several years ago by Ariel Sharon that indeed won the last parliamentary election in Israel, even though Netanyahu took the prime minister's seat, uh, what, the reason for the Kadima party was this idea that Israel had to create a second state, uh, that it had to move ahead with, uh, uh, you know, with, with talks uh, on final status issues. That's what... Tippi Livni, the, uh, the leader of the Kadima Party, believed she was, you know, kept out of power. So uh, what my point is, it's not like you know all Israelis back Netanyahu blindly in this, but Netanyahu is a right winger and he has not moved, and Obama is trying very hard to move him and trying to make the case that look, this is about Iran. And of course, one of the ironies here I pointed out in this piece I did uh, is that it was Netanyahu himself when he was running for prime minister who said, Iran, 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 this is all about Iran, we can't do anything else until we take care of the Iran problem. So, you know, that's, that's doubly uh, frustrating, I think, for, for the president. I think there's a growing trend now. Robert Wright wrote about it in uh, New York Times yesterday. Uh, a lot of people are writing about it. I talked about it on air yesterday on MSNBC at a little bit of a debate. Uh, so what is pro-Israel? And, and it's, it goes to the point that you just mentioned about uh, Israel, of course, is not monolithic. But here we have this perception, unfortunately fed by both political parties, that the right wing of Israel represents all of Israel. And that if the right wing wants to do anything like build more settlements, not really engage fruitfully in peace uh, negotiations, or whatever they want to do, well, then that must represent all of Israel. And if we want to help Israel, we should just uh, bow our heads and do whatever the right wing government tells us to do. And I think that that's really counterproductive. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, Obama, this is a very, very difficult problem, not just of international security and international politics, as you know, but of domestic politics here, because uh, let's face it, Israel is uh, the number one U.S. ally in the Mideast. There's a very powerful lobby. There's a very powerful constituency of American Jews, uh, uh, in addition to, to, you know, the right wing uh, Southern uh, evangelical con uh, conservatives. Uh, who support Israel uh, very stoutly. So you have a huge political contingent here in the United States in any election, uh, whether it's a congressional by-election or a presidential election, who have a very, very strong voice. Uh, all of that plays into uh, just how far a president can go in pushing Israel. And I would say, you know, right now Obama is pushing the envelope. I mean, his ratings, his popularity uh, among American Jews and Israelis has been very low, although it's said to be going up somewhat. Uh, so he's, you know, he's playing with political fire uh, to a certain degree here, uh, and uh, you know, and, and and he's up against a guy, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, who is at least as savvy a politician, and who is a right winger. I mean, if Tippi Livni had assumed the prime minister's seat after the last Israeli parliament, parliamentary election, I think you'd have a very, very different dynamic right now. So, final thing here, because if you're right, I think Obama should deserve a lot of credit for trying to actually get towards peace and Iran and resolve the Iran situation and having the courage to push the Israeli prime minister on that to some degree. But in the end, it's not going to work if Congress doesn't back him, and, and Netanyahu knows that, right? And when he goes to Congress, both Democrats and Republicans are all over him, and, and they, they, you know, they support him blindly. So th that well, I... Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, look, you remember, foreign policy is the one area where the president uh, wields uh, a lot of power and is perhaps less hindered uh, by Congress than he is in other areas, for example, uh, you know, domestic legislation like health care. And so even though, you know, he can't simply cut off Israel from foreign aid, and he's not going to do that anyway, uh, you know, there are a lot of things he can do as president, military, military to military cooperation, uh, which is vitally important to the Israelis. Uh, you know, he can do something about that. Uh, you know, there are, there really are ways, surprised. subtle ways in which, pardon me? I'd be really surprised if he went that direction. Because, as you well, say, he's I don't already think he's hearing... Cut it. I certainly don't think he's going to cut it off. Uh, but no. certainly there are ways of turning, you know, various nodes of cooperation on and off, depending on the, on the mood. So, Michael, finally, that, that's what, what I'm trying to figure out is, 
everybody knows how strong the Israeli lobby is, right? And there's a lot of lobbies that are strong, the NRA, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but no other country has figured out, no matter how good an ally they are, Britain, Turkey, Jordan, Egypt, it doesn't matter, right? Australia, Canada, nobody's figured out how to so effectively get bipartisan support. What are they doing right? Well, uh, they have, as you point out, you know, they have, a, they have had a very effective lobby. Um, but, I, you know, I, I wouldn't overstate that. I don't want to get into this area of conspiracy theory uh, about no, the I Jewish, don't either. That's... The Jewish lobby. I, I think there's no question it's been, a, you know, it has been a tenet of administrations, Democratic and Republican, uh, going back to Kennedy and Truman, really, uh, to support Israel uh, and as the only real democracy in the Middle East. Uh, and, you know, fighting against, uh, let's face it, uh, what have been for most of its history outsized odds against most of the Arab world. And, uh, and now you have this virtually intractable situation. Everyone, you know, acknowledges that you've got two people who are trying to occupy the same dot on the map, basically. And it's a very, very tough situation. But, so, so I think what Obama is asking for is just cooperation on the margins. I mean, we don't expect you to have a deal tomorrow. We expect you to show a real willingness to negotiate these final status issues. And that's where Netanyahu has just not uh, been able to, uh, to, to bring himself to go. And that's the essential nut of, 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 the, of the contention right now. Right. And, and look, and I don't believe in any conspiracies. That's why I'm trying to break down how it actually works in the real world. And I think you might have touched on it earlier uh, when it's not just that there's a strong uh, and healthy Israeli lobby and there's constituencies throughout the country in the different districts and states but uh, the Christian right, with their strength, uh, bringing the Republicans unquestionably in protecting Israel. Yeah. So then, I yeah, and I and I think let's 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 be frank here. Uh, the Republicans have are looking for every opening they can against Obama now. Uh, if they see him parting ways with Israel and the Jewish, you know, vote in the U.S., uh, they're going to hit that hard. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of this sort of reflexive, uh, uh, you know, championing of, of Netanyahu right now. All right, Michael Hirsch Show Newsweek, really interesting piece. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. Thanks, thanks. Take care. All right, you too. We'll be right back.